So I'm excited today to introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Veach from Texas State University. His presentation will cover the basic ecology, conservation status, uh, and his recent research on the Texas kangaroo rat. Uh, this species has received an increased amount of interest as U.S. Fish and Wildlife considers possible listing actions. And prior to a decision by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Texas Parks and Wildlife has funded multiple research projects aimed at better understanding the distribution, status, and behavior of Texas kangaroo rat, uh, aimed at informing future management and recovery actions. This particular research was funded by a Section 6 grant from Texas Parks and Wildlife and carried out by Texas State. Uh, Dr. Joseph Veach has worked as a professor in the Department of Biology at Texas State since 2008. MS from New Mexico State University and his PhD from the University of Nevada, Nevada in Reno. Um, in addition to Texas kangaroo rat, he has also conducted research on the Gulf Coast kangaroo rat, and he studies various aspects of ecological theory and um, modeling. So first, I want to thank uh, Dr. Veach for agreeing to give this presentation, and I'm look, really looking forward to it. It was a really neat project, and um, excited that you all get the opportunity to learn from him firsthand about what he uh, what he has been working on. So I will now stop sharing my screen and I will pass the controls over to Dr. Veach. Okay, uh, hopefully everybody can hear me and um... Thank you, John. You can hear me at least. I can hear you and I can see you and I now see your okay. PowerPoint. Looks perfect. Um, okay, everybody, sorry about that um, brief delay. Um, thank you again, Jonah, for the introduction and for um, inviting me to give this um, webinar presentation. So, um, as Jonah mentioned, uh, TPWD and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, have supported research on this species. And in fact, my colleagues and I here at Texas State University have been fortunate to have funding um, almost continuously since about 2016. So I'll start by talking a, a little bit about some of those uh, early projects and then uh, mostly focus on the on the research that we did in the summer of 2016 or uh, 2018, where we were using uh, radio telemetry to track the nightly movements and habitat use of uh, Texas kangaroo rats. Okay, so those other uh, participants, uh, colleagues of mine at the university um, include Dr. Randy Simpson, who retired a few years ago, but continues to be involved in some of our research activities. Um, my colleague, Dr. Yvonne Castro, who um, is involved in pretty much all the research activities as well. Uh, we previously had a grad student um, involved in the research project, Silas Ott, who uh, defended his master's degree a couple of years ago, but Silas continues to be involved in some of the research. And then also uh, Dr. Matt Milholland, who was uh, briefly a postdoc uh, for, the, for the project in the summer of uh, 2018. Matt is currently on the East Coast working for a USDA lab in Maryland, but he um, also continues to be interested in um, research on this species. I should also point out that it's not just um, folks at Texas State University that are working on it. So uh, Richard Stevens at Texas Tech and his students um, have received funding. They, they continue to work on the species as well. Um, and then also uh, Dr. Russell Fowle and colleagues at Tarleton have conducted research, uh, primarily uh, genetic research and 
which was recently published showing that there is some population subdivision um, occurring within the range of the species, probably due to some amount of habitat fragmentation. And then also, um, even for, before all of us came along, there were researchers, um, ecologists such as Jim Getze, uh, Robert Martin, Alan Nelson, Kenneth Makoka, um, that also uh, conducted studies on this species, some of which um, date all the way back to the 1970s and 80s. Okay, so a little bit of background on, on the genus Dipodomys. Um, kangaroo rats are in the family Heteromyidae. There are 20 species in Western North America. Um, so the entire genus is uh, limited to Western North America. Two of these are endemic in Texas. So the Texas kangaroo rat, Dipodomys elater, and then um, the Gulf Coast kangaroo rat, Dipodomys compactus which might actually uh, occur at the very northeastern um, coast of Mexico as well. But compactus is primarily within South Texas. Uh, it occurs on barrier islands, at least on Padre Island. All of the species, all of the Dipodomy species are, um, are in arid or semi-arid environments. So as you can tell in this, um, photo at the top, they have long hind legs, um, uh, long feet, a, a long tail that can act as a rudder of, of some sort or, or to counterbalance the, the organism when it's jumping because um, they all engage in this bipedal type of locomotion. Even if they're just um, moving along slowly, they, they, they do little hops. They don't scurry, they don't climb um, like, like a lot of rodents do. Okay, so they're completely nocturnal. Um, during the day, they're in burrows that, that they dig. Um, they're highly granivorous, so they're coming out each night to forage for seeds. And all of the species in the family have these external cheek pouches, um, which you can see on this individual. So these are these cheek pouches are not connected to their mouth to the mouth, so they're they're completely dry, and so the, the kangaroo rat would, would uh, move along the ground, picking up seeds with its forepaws, and then um, either immediately consuming them or pouching them to then go and, and cache or to take back to the burrow. They don't drink water. Um, you know, given that they're desert adapted, they obtain all of their water needs just from uh, metabolic water through, um, well, through me metabolism. So there are several species in California that have very small uh, geographic ranges. They're highly endemic. Um, they're also threatened and endangered, primarily due to loss of habitat, conversion of habitat. There are others like Dipodomys ordi and Merriami that are very widespread and common and occur over a fairly large uh, portion of Western North America. These two species, um, are also present within parts of Texas. So most of the species have very uh, specific habitat requirements. Um, they reproduce slowly compared to one litter per season where there are only maybe two or two or four, two to four offspring. Um, so this sort of makes, um, makes you know, conservation important because this is a species that if populations start to decline, can't necessarily reproduce that quickly to recover. Okay, so a little bit about um, the conservation status of the Texas kangaroo rats. Um, the small population sizes and a very limited geographic distribution, which is more or less five or six counties between Childress and Wichita Falls here in North Texas. Um, and as you'll eventually see during this presentation, it is very much a habitat specialist. So as Jonah was mentioning in the introduction, um, Texas Parks and Wildlife is um, concerned about the species, um, is you know, 
interested in in research and conservation action, um, the state of Texas considers it to be threatened. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, again, as Jonah mentioned in the introduction, um, considers it or has it listed currently as a candidate species, but they are writing um, the required SSA and a listing decision is probably due in the near future, but um, you know, the exact date, I'm not sure of. Um, the species is listed um, on the IUCN list as well. Okay, so a little bit of background on the species. Okay, so this, uh, this map is showing um, the counties where there is a historic record, uh, maybe a museum specimen that was obtained years ago our records of the species um, more recently. So you can see at one time it had a larger distribution uh, than it does now. Um, presently, we think that it's pretty much confined to uh, the five counties you see here with the asterisks. Um, but at one time, like I said, it had a much um, broader distribution and in fact, might even have been in these two counties in Oklahoma. So um, there, there have been different surveys commissioned by TPWD, range-wide surveys to try to estimate where it is, um, going all the way back to the mid-1980s, and the most recent being one that we worked on in the summers of 2016 and 17. So all of uh, these surveys, including the one, most recent one, have been informed by um, some of the previous field studies conducted by various people that found this, the species tends to occur where you have clay, clay, clay loam soils in well-drained areas. Um, it avoids thick, woody vegetation. Early on, some field studies from the 70s, maybe the early 80s, um, suggested or even um, um, gave evidence that it has a strict re requirement for mesquite. Well, we now know that that's probably not the case, but that did unfortunately kind of become established in the literature. And so some of the research that we've done and other, that other people have done more recently have um, it's, it's revealed that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, they definitely need a lot of bare ground in their habitat. Um, this facilitates their foraging and even their bipedal hopping locomotion. So uh, a limit to the amount of uh, grass and forb vegetation, but obviously enough that, um, that there are seeds being produced as a food resource. Okay, so um, this map is showing um, the, the rural highways and roads um, that are mostly unpaved that we used in doing a range-wide survey again in uh, the summers of 2016 and 17, where um, we would drive at a very slow rate of speed along these rural roads and using a spotlight um, try to find kangaroo rats uh, crossing the road in the road or along the roadside. And so this covered a lot of miles, um, kilometers, as you can see here in both years. Um, so a, a relatively thorough um, survey. Okay, so here's where we found them. Um, so 75 locations and 2016, and then um, another 63 in 2017, and 19 of those 63 were essentially the same locations as the 75 in, um, in the previous year. And you can't see the roads here, but notice that, you know, there are clusters of, um, of the locations and what you see here in green is um, some habitat mapping that we did. So 
our field surveying, literally the roads that we chose to drive um, were determined by this interactive process where we would find locations and then we do GIS mapping our analysis of the soil type and the land cover around those locations to try to figure out uh, the type of soil, more specifically, the type of soil and land cover um, that the species tended to be associated with, and that then would inform our um, our survey efforts. So this is the most inclusive version of our habitat maps, and it's one in which um, what you're seeing here in green is uh, short grass prairie and cropland that overlays clay loam and loam soils in the top layer, so the top 30 centimeters of the soil. And so just notice um, that there appears to be quite a bit of habitat, but it's widely scattered and um, somewhat fragmented and even naturally fragmented. Okay, so here now is a less inclusive um, version of the map or a more refined version where, um, again, have clay loam and loam soils in the top um, the top 30 centimeters, but then um, deeper down, uh, just clay. And notice that, again, less inclusive version, so there's less habitat being shown than in the previous map. Okay, so this is showing, this table is, um, from a recent publication showing uh, the differences between um, locations where we found uh, Texas kangaroo rat and a 150 meter radius buffer put around those locations and then compared to a buffer of the same size on random points and then in ArcGIS, determining the different um, percent covers in those different buffers for these different soil types at, for these layers. And so what you should notice is, again, these, uh, these three. So clay loam in the top layer, um, the points where are the buffers where um, Texas kangaroo rat was found tended to have about 30% more of that soil type percent cover um, than did the random locations. Um, same thing for loam, greater amount in the buffers around the Texas kangaroo rat locations, and then uh, clay at the bottom. So um, the inference there, or the, what we conclude from that, is that they require these this clay loam or loam soil in the top layer and particularly when it's overlaying a layer of clay deeper down. Okay, so here is a, um, a diagram showing differences in the land cover where the land cover is uh, broadly divided up into um, short grass prairie, um, other types of grassland, shrubland, cropland. And notice that um, there's a there's a difference here in in uh, grassland prairie in uh, shrubland where uh, the kangaroo rat locations have much less shrubland and more cropland. So this was a bit of an unexpected result: the finding of more cropland in these locations compared to random points. Okay, so. Um, as I said, that, that result, um, this association with cropland um, and avoidance of shrubland got us wondering um, whether or not we need to look into habitat use a little bit more specifically. So by the summer of 2018, that's what we wanted to do. We, we used radio telemetry um, to track the nightly movements, and in particular, try to figure out whether or not um, the kangaroo rats, which tend to have their burrows in these roadside strips of habitat, um, whether or not they go out here into the cropland at night or whether or not they go out here into the rangeland or this um, this grassland area. And so this is where we're, we're setting up to do um, radio telemetry. So this video is showing release of, a, of an individual 
Hopefully you can see it well enough. And notice the radio collar on it. Again, they hop along kind of slowly. They don't scurry around. I think eventually this one went into a burrow. Um, And I just got a message, some type of warning message, maybe just on my screen that um, you all may not have been able to see that video. It, it looked all right. It was a little bit jerky, but it came through. Okay, good. Although it's now I'm having a little bit of a problem and advancing. I'm sorry about this, guys. Um, sort of the perils of using a video. Okay, back to the show. Um, so again, here's uh, typically where we would find them, find their burrows and the strips of habitat along these rural roads. Oftentimes where there was cropland, uh, sometimes fallow, sometimes not. Um, occasionally the, the strips of roadside vegetation would be a little bit more heavily vegetated. And so let me just go through the process of doing the telemetry. So. We would trap them at night, trap the kangaroo rats at night in Sherman traps, and then return in the morning, um, you know, about at daybreak, attach a radio transmitter, and then um, keep the kangaroo rat in a bucket for about 30 minutes or so, just to monitor how well it's accepting uh, the radio collar, the radio transmitter. And then we would release um, the kangaroo rat near the borough entrance like that video showed. And then um, we would return to the location um, about 30 minutes, the same day, 30 minutes prior to sundown, and then just um, essentially wait by the roadside, wait by the burrow um, for the kangaroo rat to emerge once it, once it became dark. And then we track the movement uh, of the rat by uh, just listening for the radio signal. Um, and whenever we would, um, so listening for the radio signal while walking along the road, um, whenever we would hear a relatively strong signal, then um, using a flashlight, we would carefully try to get a visual on the rat, wherever it might be. But again, without putting the beam of the light on the rat, you know, we did not want to disrupt their normal behavior. And also the, the tracking by walking along the road to try to pick up their signal was done in a way to um, to avoid pushing the animal. So, you know, in using radio telemetry in this way, there's always the danger that um, the person observing doing the tracking is sort of pushing the animal um, away from where it might otherwise be wanting to move. And of course, you don't want that to happen. So we were careful to make sure that that, that would not happen. So eventually, um, we would get fixes on, um, on on rats that were relatively stationary for maybe you know anywhere from a, a ten or fifteen seconds up to a few minutes, uh, engaging in natural foraging behavior, and then. Um, they would return to their burrow. So typically they weren't out foraging for more than just a few minutes, occasionally as long as 20 minutes, after which time, again, they, re they returned to the burrow and then we would essentially um, repeat this process where we wait for them to come back out again. Okay, so we um, conducted this telemetry on 16 individuals located in these uh, three counties. 
um, one, one location um, in each of the three counties with this number of individuals tracked between these dates. Uh, the, the radio transmitter was a hollow hill model BD2 and importantly, very lightweight, so 0 0.9 grams. And doing radio telemetry, the lighter the um, attached device, the better. So on this rat, you can kind of see that there's a little bit of an antenna here. I think the antenna was maybe only a couple of centimeters in length, but that was good enough. And then um, the, the um, radio transmitter is actually glued to this little Tyvek collar that we fitted to, to the rat. So for most individuals, uh, we collected data for three to five consecutive nights, uh, starting that very first night. Um, some individuals we tracked again for a few nights, uh, two to three weeks after that um, first um, round of tracking. Okay, so just to emphasize again, um, these two aerial or this single aerial, aerial photograph of two counties, parts of two counties, um, is showing um, quite a bit of habitat fragmentation. Uh, you know, it's patches of cropland, grassland, even some mesquite thickets, scattered towns um, and farmsteads throughout this. A very fragmented um, type of habitat. This blue line here is actually showing where we consistently um, found kangaroo rats in their burrows the entire length of this. Um, and I think it goes for maybe about a mile and a half. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some um, relatively close in um, aerial imagery uh, from Google Earth of a few of the individuals noting their burrow locations as well as um, the fixes, you know, again, spots where the kangaroo rats became uh, stationary and, you know, appeared to be engaged in normal foraging behavior. Um, the imagery, I believe, is from March of 2015. Uh, so, you know, a few years before we actually um, conducted the study, but, you know, things don't change very quickly up there in that part of Texas. And so when we when we conducted the study um, in the summer of 2018, this was still cropland planted in cotton. This was um, grassland, shrubland. So notice for this individual, um, first of all, the use of uh, six different burrows um, that are somewhat widely spaced and also um, the individual would go into the, the cropland a little bit, not that far, but most of the foraging was confined to just the edge, sometimes even in the habitat strip. Notice a burrow right here on the edge of the, um, the grassland, shrubland area, but no, um, no foraging activity that we ever detected within this um, natural habitat. Okay, so another individual now, um, the previous one was an adult female, this one is as well. And um, first of all, some amount of overlap with, with the previous one. The previous one had um, activity right through here as well as down into here. This individual again used, um, like the previous one, used several different burrows, um, went into the cropland a little bit, never went far from its burrow and foraging, and like the previous one, did not go into the, um, into the grassland area. Okay, so here now um, is a juvenile male, um, kind of in the same area. So we've actually moved down the road a little bit. Um, HA1 and HA2 have overlap here with this individual. And notice that there are two very spatially distinct areas of activity here. And I believe this area right here was at some later 
time period when we return to track it. So it's possible that this individual, um, this male was forcibly relocated. Um, you know, either one of the two females here might have been um, responsible for that male moving down and um, becoming more active down here and occupying a borough down here as well. Okay, so some more of the, the numerical results from the uh, from the tracking. Um, each individual right here in this column, then the number of nights that we did the tracking, the total number of fixes, um, the borough usage. Uh, you know, what's important here is again that they're using um, most individuals are using more than one borough. Um, the distance between boroughs can be quite great. Um, a lot of times we recorded fixes in the boroughs. So during the telemetry, each night we would um, go around and check to make sure um, where the rats were. And a lot of times we did find them within their within the boroughs, the radio signals coming from the borough. But some of the other findings that we can list um, are that they don't go very far from the borough. So um, the, the mean distance to the nearest borough is um, quite short for um, for most of the kangaroo rats, the possible exception of this one. Uh, the greatest distance that they might go also tends to not be very far. They, they primarily will stay close to, um, to the roadside for their foraging. And in fact, they even use these roadsides to, to some extent. They, we didn't often find them like right in the middle of the of the road moving down it, but they would oftentimes um, run along the side of the road. Uh, they forage in, um, or tend to forage mostly in that roadside um, strip of habitat and the edges of um, the crop fields. And then finally, although it's not necessarily being directly shown in this table, um, Again, they just did not enter into the rangeland, that, that natural grassland area, except for the possible occasions where um, we were tracking a rat near um, really degraded rangeland that um, you know, was nearly devoid of um, vegetation. And that's even considering that all the individuals that you see here, except those circled in blue, had access to the rangeland. So the rangeland was in the immediate vicinity uh, of the rat and they could have easily um, entered into it if, if they had so chosen. Uh, let me point out that um, these four kangaroo rats at Wilbarger County, um, we didn't get any data for them outside their burrow and that probably is because um, the dates where we were attempting tracking, um, those nights had almost a full moon and other studies uh, for various kangaroo rat species have shown that um, that moonlight can inhibit um, their nightly activity. Um, they wanna avoid moonlit nights simply because of predation risk um, from uh, primarily from owls. Okay, so visually, what exactly is degraded rangeland habitat? Well, it's this um, type of scenario where a lot of bare ground, very short vegetation that um, has been overgrazed or just degraded in some way. So this is Matt Milholland and Silas Ott at a location where um, there is a burrow right here, probably about 100 meters from the road. And indeed, we did trap. Um, a kangaroo rat there. We didn't use it in the tracking, um, but there was one there. And so, to some extent, this is the type of habitat that they seem to uh, to seek out and, and to want. Again, just a few visuals um, showing this. There is a burrow. So the burrow is right here, I believe. Um, very short vegetation um, and sparse vegetation, grassy vegetation along the roadside strip, but a lot of bare ground um, between the roadside strip and then 
the crop and they use this. Another visual uh, in a different location also showing the same scenario of a burrow and a rat that would be living in the roadside strip of vegetation here that is kind of sparse and thin. And then in this case, a crop field that's really not maintained very well. It's very weedy. Um, but that perhaps may be beneficial to the kangaroo rats, particularly if some of these plants are relatively close to the um, to the edge here or producing seeds. I believe this is a um, cotton field. Again, just some more visuals showing um, that they can occupy these roads, roadside strips of habitat, even when there's very little standing vegetation, a lot of bare ground, fallow crop field right here and on the other side. I believe this is a, a site where um, some roadside maintenance had been done relatively recently, some shredding or some uh, mowing of the vegetation. And there were plenty of burrows through here. So just to emphasize um, this, this difference, this is where we tend to not find them. I mean, this, you know, to our eyes, this looks like nice, healthy rangeland, grassland um, that actually has, you know, a minimal amount of shrub cover. Um, this looks really nice. This is sort of how we would want rangeland to appear probably. But if you, if you look close in, the grass is just way too thick. The vegetation is way too thick for kangaroo rats to use this. Um, this thick vegetation probably inhibits their, their bipedal form of locomotion. And um, again, to emphasize, this is what they want. They, they seem to associate mostly with and use um, degraded rangeland like this. Just a few more photos. Um, there's the burrow and a kangaroo rat was occupying that burrow. Um, it looks like there may be some crop there in the background, but plenty of bare ground as well and this is even a uh, roadside strip where there had been some um, recent mowing or some other type of maintenance activity to remove nearly all the um, the standing grass and yet um, like i said there were still burrows and kangaroo rats present here even along this single uh strip of road um one side we found burrows and kangaroo rats, this side right here, where um, there's a lot of bare ground, the vegetation is thinner compared to over here, where the vegetation is much, much thicker and higher. Um, we searched this fairly thoroughly, but never did find um, any burrows. So even this difference between these two sides of the road, um, the kangaroo rats respond to. Okay, so then that brings up the question, uh, historically, um, before we had roads in that part of Texas, and before it was settled, um, what ecological processes maintain this uh, sparse vegetation, this bare ground dominated habitat that they seem to, to need? Well, one that comes to mind, obviously, is fire, uh, grassland fires that could create habitat really quickly and create a lot of it. So you can almost imagine that um, fire, fires oftentimes leave behind a mosaic. So there may have been scattered um, on the landscape, there may have been scattered patches of natural vegetation providing uh, uh, food resource seeds, as well as um, you know bare ground that's created after the fire burns. But the catch is that uh, with enough precipitation, particularly in that part of Texas, the, the grass, the vegetation can grow back relatively quickly um, and then cease to be habitat for the kangaroo rats. Another possibility is bison grazing. And as with fire, large areas uh, of potential habitat maybe were created. Although with bison grazing, um, you know, unlike cattle grazing, bison tend to move around a lot. They don't raised as intensively, so maybe this would have been insufficient intensity to truly create uh, that habitat that the kangaroo rats need. 
And in addition, the, the bison wallows simply would never have been large enough uh, to support populations of kangaroo rats. So what about prairie dogs? Um, anybody that uh, has walked through a, a prairie dog town or seen one up close knows that the prairie dogs really do keep the vegetation clipped way down within the town and the towns can be very large. Um, there are historical accounts of large prairie dog towns in that part of Texas uh, where, the, where Texas kangaroo rats currently exist. And some of these towns were definitely still present um, in the 1890s and in a few locations and smaller towns were probably still present even into the 1920s. Um, in subsequent years, prairie dogs in this part of Texas were pretty much um, eradicated. But at one time, again, they were, they were widespread. Um, there were a lot of, a lot of towns of, you know, of, large area that probably uh, provided habitat. And it could be that the kangaroo rats weren't necessarily right in the middle of the prairie dog town, but rather um, specialized on the edge where there was enough bare ground, but also seed producing plant species. Okay, so what does all this mean about uh, the preservation Texas kangaroo rats, and particularly their preservation or protection in in areas um, in certain areas where they can be protected. Well, um, unfortunately, one of the challenges is that in that part of Texas, there's very little state-owned or federally owned property. There is a state park, um, Copper Break State Park is located within the the range of the species, um, and it has about about 40% of it has the correct type of soil, but the vegetation is very thick. It's somewhat overgrown. And so it's definitely not habitat, at least not in its current state. So um, habitat management for this species is definitely going to require um, ongoing efforts to suppress woody vegetation, and also uh, any thick growing um, grass or other herbaceous vegetation um, will have to be um, suppressed continually. Another, um, another task will be to somehow facilitate um, plant species that, um, that can provide the necessary um, seeds as a food resource. So, um, Preservation and habitat management, um, it's, it's doable, but it's going to be somewhat challenging and a constant effort if we want the species to exist in areas other than just these roadside strips of habitat. Okay, uh, well, thank you all for attending um, this webinar. Um, as Jonah mentioned in the intro, this research has been supported by um, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. And if any of you want more information about Texas kangaroo rats and our um, ongoing research um, efforts, you can contact me at this email address. Joe, thank you so much for that presentation. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, I, I should, I, I think I neglected to say that in the beginning, so I do want to restate that uh, Parks and Wildlife funded this research through a Section 6 grant, which came from Fish and Wildlife. And so uh, it's a, a definitely a multi-partner agency uh, effort. Um, hey, so we have a few questions here that I, I promised at the beginning we would get to. So um, the first one is, is by Dwayne Lucia. It says, on the most inclusive map, uh, Wait, it's a little bit okay. On the most inclusive map, there were a couple of clusters that fell outside of their expected habitat. Green. Um, what was that habitat type where they were found in? Yes, I'm going back to it now. Um, my so maybe. Uh, 
referring to this? I believe so. I believe some of like some of the spots that were outside of the green. He was just kind of wondering what those habitat so, types were. I, I suspect that there's still green there, but it's just the resolution resolution of the map. You can't see it that well. Mm, okay. Um. Yeah, I mean that's. I'd have to zoom in and go yeah, back yeah. to the ArcGIS files. Okay. Well, well, then the next question by John Young. Do you know what percentage of the potential habitat based on your modeling was viewable from the roadway? I'm wondering what percentage of the habitat uh, that lies on private land is unsurveyed. Um, well, potentially, I mean, there could be a lot of habitat um, or potential habitat on private land. Um, I didn't mention that in the summers of uh, 2016 and 17, we attempted to get access, um, and it was uh, you know thorough efforts to try to find landowners that, um, from you know roadside view, appeared to have um, kangaroo rat habitat on their property. But that was met with limited success. There, there were about, I think there were anywhere from maybe five to ten landowners that did get in contact with us, but. Um, Sure enough, upon you know visiting their properties, we could quickly tell that it was just, their properties were just too overgrown with vegetation. To have and, and, and so he had a follow up to that too. That said, do you feel, given what you know and, um, about private lands in the area, um, about how they're managed, I guess that there could be a large number of unaccounted for kangaroo rats on private lands in certain places. Well, right. So that's sort of the catch. I mean, those photos of the degraded rangeland that I show, showed earlier, um, you know, uh, hopefully no uh, rancher would want his or her property to um, to get to that state. Um, you know, bad for the kangaroo rat, but, um, you know, good, good land management or stewardship would suggest that um, that amount of overgrazing or whatever factor led to that, um, that, you know, tremendous loss of vegetation doesn't happen. Um, so typical, typical grazing practices, you know, unfortunately probably are not for the most part creating habitat for the species. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sherry Wilson asked, were the collars removed following the surveys? Yeah, so good question. I sort of neglected to mention that, but, but the collars were removed. Um, and in fact, um, as part of that funded project, we uh, were tasked with um, getting um, uh, kangaroo rats for the Fort Worth Zoo to initiate a captive population. And so some of those collared rats were recaptured, um, collar removed and just, you know, released. And then others were um, taken to the zoo. Uh, what is the distance measurement in? I think they were asking if it was in meters or I don't remember where, which slide that was on, but um, we had two questions, one from Omar Bocanegra and Jeff Bonner asking, are the distances in meters? Um, yeah, but um, well, what slide? <laughs> well, so right here it says forty kilometers. So it must not have been on this slide. If somebody wants to um, ask another question at the bottom, one of if one of you all who asked that want to clarify, it says table of borough distance. Oh, okay. Um, Yeah, so, um, sorry, that those are all meters. <laughs> yeah. that, that should be up there somewhere, but it's not. Uh, yeah, no problem. I appreciate you answering that. Um, does this species occur on any protected conservation site in Texas? Yeah, again, I, one of the challenges is, um, is that it does not. Um, so I mentioned copper breaks um, where there, there's the correct soil type, but the but the you know ground level vegetation's uh, way too thick, um, and in fact, 
there, are, there is a historic capture uh, from someone doing a study years ago right next to Copper Break. So um, presumably, again, I mean, there may be kangaroo rats in the area surrounding Copper Breaks, but they're not actually within the park. So that's not a viable uh, protected area for them. There's another location, I think it's um, called Lake Kemp, that is administered by the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, we checked it out, we did a site visit and also looked at where it, where it was on our habitat maps and it, for the most part, it just doesn't have the correct type of soil. Um, how much of roadside use is influenced by those are the areas where have been able to have access? Sorry, I'm having a heart. Um, oh, oh, I'm sorry. No, like my um, the chat keeps moving around here. Okay, roadside berms may be conducive to the K rat, perhaps mimicking disturbance soil friability uh, that bison may have contributed. Indigenous prairie. That was a comment by John Cargis. And then right after that, he said, ah, like maybe you address that shortly afterwards. Um, uh, possibly. I mean, I, I agree with him that to some extent, bison might have created some habitat, potential habitat. Um, but again, it would it would require enough grazing by the bison. Okay. Are there any invasive grass species in the natural areas? Uh, if so, could they contribute to dense vegetation? Yeah, so part of that project in uh, 2016 and 17 was to compile a list of, of plant species found near to the burrows. And that list is really long, um, dozens and dozens of species, including some um, invasive grass species. I haven't looked at that uh that information in a while so like off the top of my head i can't even comment on which ones there were but there there definitely were some there um so uh bailey noted that tkr was common around settlers homes and in farm fields what are your thoughts about the effects of human movement and changes in land use and how they affected tkr historically so my own opinion of this is that um, that eradication of these uh, prairie dog colonies has probably had a detrimental effect, but that happened decades and decades ago. We're not going to reverse that. Um, that's correct that they that kangaroo rats, Texas kangaroo rats, will dig burrows and even use areas that are you know very close to human disturbance. Um, we had one that had its burrow um, up underneath an abandoned combine um, that you know was rusting, and um, still, you know, that didn't deter the kangaroo rat from putting its burrow there. So anywhere where there's enough bare ground as well as um, seed-producing plant species, they they can they can occupy. That. And I, I have. I don't doubt at all that some of the early settlers, when they moved into that area and started clearing out, you know, the land around their homes, they probably had um, Texas kangaroo rats around. Although it's worth mentioning, I didn't mention that there is another species. So, Ord's kangaroo rat, Dibidomys ordi, is up in that area as well. And the surveys, um, we we got information on its locations as well, but it uses a different type of soil. So there's very little overlap between the two. Um, Brian Small asks, how ephemeral are these burrow locations and bare ground? Did you see high or low site fidelity when surveying the same locations from 2016 to 2017? Yeah, so some of the research or data that we collected that year that I didn't present right now um, shows that in the same location, you can find burrows in consecutive years. So um, you know, the boroughs are maintained to some extent. Um, and you can even tell, you know, when you're doing the field work and out there surveying for boroughs, occasionally, you know, you'll find a borough that has spider webs or other vegetation, a burrow opening has spider webs or other vegetation, just debris in the opening, in which case you know that it's not occupied or being used by kangaroo. Um, Lee Fitzgerald just said, thank you so much for the interesting uh, talk. 
but you'd like to know that. And then Russell Martin asked, do y'all think the juvenile male that was displaced from natal range was a dispersal event? So a good question. So we didn't really, um, I mean, despite the title of the talk um, and even the, the funded project, in the end, we didn't really um, get data on dispersal. So there were two individuals I didn't talk about that um, that very quickly early on, like the first night or so, went completely out of our search capacity. So both of them went um, about three or 400 meters away from the borough that we had released them into, and they went way off into private land, so we couldn't track them. Those might be dispersal events. The male being displaced, um, which, uh, which he was referring to, could be the initiation of a dispersal event, uh, particularly if it was, um, you know, the offspring of one of those two females. The two females were larger in body mass than that male, and so it's you know it, it, it's reasonable that they, you know, quote unquote, forced it out. So it's um it's one oh one. I'm going to give us just a couple more minutes and and give you the opportunity to give, you know. One to 10 word answers to a couple of these questions so we can sort of have a chance to address the rest of them. Um, any idea as to survival of your collared animals or collar loss? All locations in a borough would suggest maybe mortality or collar loss. Suggestions for other studies using telemetry slash GPS question mark. I guess by Clint Bull. Yeah, that's a big question. <laughs> so the, the short. The short answer is we did have two mortality events, one natural in that a rattlesnake got the kangaroo rat and we received the radio signal from the belly of the rattlesnake. Um, the other event was that unfortunately the, the collar got sort of trapped around the individual's mouth and so we actually recovered um, that um, carcass. Um, so I, I have a lot of suggestions about can, you know other telemetry approaches for this species um, that I can comment on in some other capacity. So has Oklahoma made any recent concerted efforts to determine if they have them? I know they've made efforts in the past. I believe the answer is sort of, right? They've done some efforts. They have. So uh, one of the um, mammologists at the University of Oklahoma, Janet Braun, um, I think a few years back, they did a survey, a lot of driving and checking potential habitat, and they didn't find any, they didn't find burrows. But I think also that part of their um, way in which they did the, the surveys, they were still guided by this notion that Texas kangaroo rats need um, mesquite. But it's worth pointing out that um, there are very few records of them in those two counties in Oklahoma, and the records are very, very old. Mm. Uh, are they foraging on similar species in the cropland as they would in other areas, or is it just weed seeds, or is it weed seeds and crop seeds? Uh, yeah, the extent to which they're using any kind of crop seed, we don't know. So some of the uh, crops grown up there include wheat. Um, I don't think there's any corn being grown. I don't remember, and a lot of cotton. I doubt that they're. You know, they really wouldn't be able to access uh, cotton seed, which is caught up in you know the cotton filament. Um, so it's mostly weed seeds, yes. Okay, we're nearing the end here. Given the development of solar projects in the known range, do you think the maintenance regimes used at solar facilities, regular mowing and brush removal, could provide additional TKR habitat? Yeah, it's possible. I mean, the the footprint um, produced by those um, those facilities might provide some amount of habitat. Um, I don't think anybody has has looked into that. This is an interesting question. The uh, North Texas Red River Valley seem to be hotspots for t tornadoes. How do tornadoes play into creating habitat? Yeah, that is a good question. So I previously lived in, um, in Northern Colorado in a part of the state where um, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of prairie. And before I moved, we had a tornado come close to the town. And afterwards you could see like a, um, probably about a 40 meter wide strip where the tornado had passed, just completely denuding the, the grassy vegetation. 
you know, whether or not that happens often enough to have created habitat um, is sort of an open question, but certainly um, a strong tornado can rip up the vegetation even off of grassland. Um, is anything known about dispersal and would they require the same continuous habitat structure in order to disperse? So another good question, I mean, we think that, or it's possible that they could be dispersing along these, um, these linear strips of habitat, which would provide some type of, um, you know, connection between scattered um, groups of them. Um, you know, presumably something like that could be happening. Uh, okay. But otherwise, we, so we, don't, we just don't have any information on truly long distance dispersal. How do you immobilize rats for collaring? How do you do what? Immobilize rats for collar? Um, so we used a mild, um, what's the words escaping me? It's ketamine, um, okay. or not ketamine, isoflurane. Okay. Uh, so we would briefly uh, knock them out with the isoflurane. And really, they didn't even have to go all the way under. And it usually, Usually we could get that collar on within about 30 or 40 seconds. Um, okay, hang on. Someone, someone pointed out that I missed their question. Um, but I'm not seeing, oh, I'm finished foraging a similar species in the crop. Yeah, I got that one. Um, maybe that was, maybe that was earlier. Um, their habitat is almost exclusively being created by road grading, yes? Yeah, yes and no. So the, the road grading helps in that if, um, if that roadside strip of vegetation gets really overgrown, then it's conceivable that it could become too thick for uh, the kangaroo rats. So then occasional mowing of it or just somehow um, knocking back that vegetation is beneficial.